Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, March 1st, 2023 meeting of SIG Auth. Hop over to the agenda. The first item to discuss is the um, external signing key for service count tokens draft cap. Yeah, um, so we talked about this, I think like late November and then there were the holidays and so, so it's been a while. Um, but there, I, I did receive some feedback that I tried to include in this, um, and I followed the feedback to open a new cap instead of trying to edit the other one. Um, I don't have an issue ID. Um, I don't know if I should just like open a new issue and link it to this, and then use that for the for the cap number. Um, sorry, what was that last part? Oh, um, so. Should I, oh, so the, the old issue is closed. So um, should I just open a new issue and basically link to the old one and then use that for the cap number? Yeah, I think that would be the best thing to do. We, we can okay. start fresh. Um, given it's been so long since we uh, did the old one. So I guess, um, this is probably slated for 128 then? Yeah, ideally. Okay. Cool. Did, uh, are there any significant changes from the uh, previous cap or I guess previous proposal? Um, nothing major, just added a few small things from feedback from Mo, like um, for like health checking and things like that. Cool. Um, sounds good. I guess we can review and then discuss uh, in more detail in a later SIGOT. For, for the, uh, I know I looked at the doc. I hadn't had a chance to look at the pull request. Um, did, is, was it pretty easy to see the responses to the questions that were in the doc? I didn't see any inline responses, so I wasn't sure. <clears throat> like some of, some of the questions I had were like how this interacts with the controller manager and um, th things like that. So I wasn't sure. Yeah, I was I was looking through the doc the other day, um, trying to find it. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like Micah responded about the uh, KCM oh. stuff. Um, and then um, this should be include the algorithm yeah um yeah I, I i i'll double check but i believe i included like the the feedback about the algorithm um and i put a note in the pr for yeah i think most of it is in the pr I, i'll double check okay yeah micah had asked if the controller manager would generation of tokens was deprecated. And um, there were two types of tokens the controller manager created. It auto-created tokens, and that's no longer happening. But it also would fill in secrets that were um, requested. And so that's still supported. Um, so I, I, I do think we need to figure out how this would interact with that aspect. Um, I <clears throat> just looking at the like the, the motivation, the main motivation listed is talking about being able to reload a signing key to rotate keys. And um, just adding support for dynamically rereading the file would be way easier to meet that motivation. And so if the motivation is actually to support like out of process signing that would be good to hoist into the motivation because that, um, yeah. Like there are way easier ways to get uh, rotation without restarting. Yeah, um, that's <clears throat> that's um, good, good feedback. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll think about that some more and chat with um, Mike and some other folks and that okay. might be the route we end up going. Okay. Um, Did you mean you mean you would update motivation, or you mean you would 
you would just reload the file. Like your goals don't match your motivation. I don't have an yeah, issue with yeah. either the goals or the motivation, but. Yeah. So um, I think uh, I'm, I need to go see which one's which, but I, I think going the route of just the dynamically reloading the file, um, if that, you know, that would solve our use case and we'd be able to stop carrying the patch that we're carrying. So. Yeah, there, there's a lot of prior art for dynamic reloading of various things, client certs and CA bundles and config files, maybe in some cases, I can't remember. So um, that's a pretty well paved path. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. So I'm a little confused. Is that the motivation? Because if it is, we don't really need a cap, right? You just, just go fix it, just go reload the file. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. If, if that's okay, yeah, I can, I can spin up a, a PR then for that. I, I'm just a little confused. Like, I guess like, so I, I know you guys have had a patch for this for a long time. I feel like you would have just done that if that's what was needed. I, I, I'm, I'm just a little lost now because like, it's way more work to build an entire RPC thing, wire it up to something, carry a patch for it. I don't know. Is, am I missing something? Because, yeah, I'm, I'm totally down if you just want to. Um, yeah, I it, it might be that I'm missing something. Um, I am coming into this. I didn't have that much context um, on originally. Uh, but like how it was implemented and why originally several years ago. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll need to follow up with our auth team and see if they have any plans, um, like what, what their plans look like and how just doing the dynamic reload sounds to them. Okay, yeah, just let us know, maybe either tweak, tweak this to sort of make sense with the out of tree focus, and then we can sort of evaluate that and figure out like if, um, if that's, a reasonable path forward or if the, the dynamic stuff would need your goals. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Next up is pre-cap workload certificates uh, to here. Yeah, just kind of throwing this out there so people can read it and form some opinions. I don't think we need to have a, like a long discussion on it today. But so this is sort of like looking at what would the, the next thing after cluster trust bundles. So cluster trust bundles are the mechanism for distributing roots of trust within the cluster. The other half of X509 is actually getting your leave certificates. Um, so I'm outlining and I have some sort of proof of concept code linked there as well, because uh, it was way easier to like start coding it and then come back and co-design it. Um, um, but basically what I'm proposing is that we give Kubelet the ability to have a projected volume source that generates a key and goes off to some in-cluster signer and requests a certificate from it. Um, and then automatically rotate the key insert when it looks like the cert is approaching its expiration. Um, right now, the way I've outlined that happening is via a new thing that is like a certificate request, signing request object, but with different semantics and different admission checks. Um, I think there's significant like design space flexibility in that part. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I don't know that I have much more to really talk about it than that. I see your hands up. So just looking through the um, the goals and like quickly browsing. The, the API produced. Is there anything about the idea of having a spiffy identity that 
cause that shapes the way the API would be created differently than just your first goal of uh, a well-known signer that would work for the API server client? No, so I actually went to great lengths to make this totally agnostic to whatever ends up in this server. Like we don't want to take any, you know, this is sort of building on top of the entry, I don't, on top of the existing signer mechanism where you can have pluggable third-party things just existing in the cluster answering certificate signing requests. Um, and so this is just saying, from the perspective of all the machinery, none of this machinery cares what is in the issued cert. Um, okay, that so that would mean that if we wanted to, we would be able to develop this and later add Spiffy. Uh, I know you've been wanting Spiffy for a long time, right? But we'd later be able to add Spiffy. Yeah, see, I don't. Okay, I don't um, really mind what goes. So the, the only reason I've included anything about Spiffy under the possible goals section is that the moment we create a default certificate that can be used as an API server client, customer or like users are going to start depending on the format of that certificate for their own workload to workload authentication. So we need to make sure it's what we want. Or we could play games where we don't make the, like we make it a different CA from the cluster CA and we don't expose its trust anchors anywhere inside the cluster so that they can't rely on it. Um, okay. Yeah, but my main interest here is to land the mechanism rather than specifically landing some sort of default implementation. Although I think the default implementation is like a logical next step. Uh, I agree. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out if it drew part of the API or not. So, thanks. It looks like a cool feature. Uh, to cool. where are we on the, the, the actual trust anchor stuff? Are we, are we doing, is that going to make it for 127? It I got think so. It's back on Liggett's week. review. Yep. So <laughs> yeah. all the comments got addressed, and it's back in my queue. So I'm hoping to get to it today. Okay. So that, if I remember correctly, that's the that's just the REST API, right? With all the very carefully thought out validation and semantics around it, and also the Kubelet projection. So there's another PR open that I think is also in the API review queue, doing the Kubelet half of it. Okay, so it's at a round of review from Mike. Okay, so if we had both of those, then you have the ability to express uh, your anchors and the ability for the kubelet to mount them for you into pods, but for but nothing from the API server yet. Like the API server can't use it for like webhook anchors or anything. Yet. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I was just trying to remind myself how far we got on this. Um, um, okay. A question about possible future like graduation criteria, thinking this through. Um, not saying it's definitely a thing, but how would you feel if one of those criteria for moving to beta, for instance, or, or moving to stable was demonstrating how a, a workload that wanted to have its own signing, its own signer and its own trust anchor would be able to use this API to have other workloads easily create a certificate only good for communicating to itself uh, and have that flow function. Um, is that is that a flow you envision happening? Is it, um, I guess just start there. Yeah, I guess so. I definitely make think, think it makes sense to like, link the beta or GA criteria of the cluster trust bundles work and the um, any forthcoming like workload certificate mounting stuff because they're meant to be used together at least in part as like a a unified whole. Um, I do think that so demonstrating like so are you talking about maybe having a third party signer that exists within the cluster and then Workloads can use it for pod to pod communication. Yeah, I haven't I haven't dug all the way through, but that seems like a natural way to use what's being created here. Yeah. Um, and I don't have 
having not read, I apologize, I have not read this entire doc yet. I don't immediately know all the parts that would come together and how much burden there would be on someone trying to actually make that work. That is the intended use case. So I think okay. that I'm totally fine with adding that as a criteria. Um, okay. And I'm like actively working on an implementation of that. Cool. In <clears throat> um, let me add a, another item. I, there's one open question I have about the cluster trust model stuff, but I don't want to hijack the agenda. So I'll add something else to the end. Sounds good. All right. Um, Mo, deck reuse. Okay. So I wanted to bring this up. Um, to get people's feedback. I talked with Jordan about this earlier today just to start the conversation with him. But the general just is so we just started collecting metrics from CI on you know running a cluster that's using KMS v2 and just seeing the numbers of like basically what the cost of these operations is. And when everything is awesome, the cost of these operations is like fractions of milliseconds, so it doesn't matter. But when things are like not so awesome, it can add like a hundred milliseconds of latency to like write calls. So that's not super awesome. Um, so this had been discussed a long time ago for Cam SV1, but we didn't push it through because we didn't have a way to make it work sort of correctly with storage migration um, because storage migration, uh, because the KMS layer did not have a way of correctly informing um, the REST storage layer that it needed to have uh, a rewrite for key staleness. Um, so with KMS v2, we fixed that with the whole key ID concept. So the plugin can tell us, as in the API server, that I know all your bytes are all exactly right, but I need you to issue a write anyway, because I plan on changing how I store the data by encrypting it differently. So we have all those capabilities now. Um, so what this PR does is it removes the inline one-to-one -one mapping on write calls to make an immediate encrypt call. And instead what it does is on a background go routine, basically every minute it's gonna sit there and create a new deck and that deck will get reused for that minute approximately. Um, I still need to update some of the semantics. so. The gist is that the current plan I had was if the plugin is having a hard time, basically like it's in some broken state, we would reuse the deck for up to two minutes, but afterwards we would not allow further writes with it. Uh, I mean, we're well within any window of AAS GCM uh, key reuse, right? We're, we're, we're it's like, like effectively theoretically impossible to use it fast enough in that time to hit anything. But it, you do have to answer the question, right? Previously it was always one right. Now it's like some number of N over in some amount of time. Um, but yeah, just in general, like we we saw, um, like to give you an example in the E2E test that we have for Canvas right now, it ends up doing like 14,000 encryptions, but like with this PR it does like 30. Um, so it, you know, vastly reduces the load on your plugin. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm still working on optimizing it. So like right now it just always keeps making new keys. I'm going to make it. So it only makes a new key when the key has been used at least once. And, and the plugin hasn't changed this key ID. Uh, but I wanted to get feedback on this because it, it, I think it's one of like, it's one of the few like true divergences from KMS V1. Uh, like I think. So far, V2 has just been very carefully expanding and polishing on what existed before. Uh, but I think this one is pretty significantly different. And uh, like the, the two minute number basically comes from like, well, how long would you need to tell an operator if they don't want to actively figure out uh, if like plugin state has been observed to like wait, right? Like, so there's metrics that tell you the state of the plugin, but there's not a REST API yet. So like 
if you didn't want to be an active migrator, you, you could do like a time dot sleep three minutes or whatever. And you would know that if you change your state, it has since been observed. Um, so I wanted to get feedback, see if there was concerns or other things. Um, but yeah, my, my, my feeling is we should make this change before going to beta. So that way we don't change the contract of how the system is going to internally work under people when it's in the beta state. And my feeling is that with the numbers I'm seeing on the, from the metrics that we do need a change like this because otherwise the performance just isn't sort of good enough to really be a motivating factor from like V1 to V2. One other thing to point out is that um, having some amount of deck reuse um, that's bounded uh, also helps in read cases. So if you on cluster creation, you know, we create, I don't know, a thousand node objects and a thousand whatever uh, events and leases and are back, whatever. I don't know. We do a bunch of stuff on cluster creation uh, with deck reuse, you know, a big storm, right storm will actually mostly reuse the same deck keys, um, decks, uh, so that on read, you don't have to fill your read cache with a thousand different uh, decks. Um, so it, it does help in the read case as well when there are a lot of objects written close together. Um, Do we care that like whether or not the decks eventually diverge after that right storm? I mean, like, this is, it, is, is it primarily it for the right case so that yeah. a flake in the KMS or a blip doesn't like it, it makes yeah. it so like from the security perspective, like is it bad that everything was written with the same deck in the long term? Well, it's not in the long term, it's bounded to like a minute, right? Yeah, I guess so. We're we're assuming that those uh, like those secrets all get touched again, sort of randomly in the future, and and the decks they were written with diverge. Like Maybe. I I don't think that the fact that each object had its own deck was not like we didn't actually care a lot about that. The reason we had a one to one was because it was hard to track how many times it had been used, and there were like concerns about hitting theoretical reuse on its own uh, AES stuff. So and we also lacked a way for the plugin to tell us that, hey, the remote implementation that remote KMS has rotated its key. So you like whatever state you have is no longer valid. I need you to start over, regardless of what you were doing previously. I need you to make new decks and I need you to let me rotate out. Right. So it's basically your hierarchy of keys has changed. So now like now the plugin can inform you without any API server restarts, without any of like the really heavy, um, painful migrations, right? You can, like ba basically the system can coast uh, on like a functional state and you can change your functional state and it'll very quickly notice it and start letting you migrate to it. Um, okay. In fact, the design of KMSV2 was made in a way so that the, the plugin could actually implement a key hierarchy and not have to hit the back end KMS one to one for every piece of data in the system. So we're sort of already expecting that most people are doing KMS. Yeah. To, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was just, just curious so, if there, if there was any any concerns there, but yeah, I think it's okay. I don't think so. Um, the the two main things that I wanted to be sure of were that we could really clearly communicate the bounding of time. So if I if I rotate my uh, root key, like after what point can I be confident that every write is going to be um, using that key? Uh, initially, like I think a one minute period, like one or two minutes, like low single digit minutes is probably fine as a default. And I'm not sure we need a configurable knob. Like, it takes time to do a data rotation anyway to, to do a storage migration. So like saying, rotate your key, queue a job for like two minutes later to start the migration, that seems probably okay. If we get feedback in beta that, nope, we absolutely need to be able to configure this shorter or longer. Like, I guess we could add a knob, but I'm not sure we need a knob. 
so bounding the time was the big concern. And then uh, the other thing was what Mo mentioned, like making it uh, not make calls in steady state if it's not needed. So even yeah, though we have sense. this background thing, um, if we're not actually, if someone only encrypted secrets, for example, and no secrets are being written, like we shouldn't need to get a new deck every minute. We'll just got wait until we use it. Yeah, I've got, I've got another question that might be a little off topic, so feel free to skip it if it's if you want to keep talking about this proposal, um, which is, is there anything in KMSV2 or are we thinking about anything like, like today, if I try to list secrets and even one of the secrets can't be decrypted <laughs> like, I can't list any of them, and I can't even find out which one can't be decrypted because, uh, you know, there's no like metadata on the secrets that I can get because it's encrypted with the secret. Um, we actually like did just add logging so that if there's a decode error, the server will actually log the etcd path of the thing that couldn't be decoded. So you don't have any of the content, but you have enough log <laughs> to find like the names, like the namespace name, like the key. Um, it's not great, but it's better than nothing. Can, can uh, I delete? No, MSV2 does not try to fix like something being broken with part of your storage layer. Well, it's not it's not really something like broken in the storage layer, right? It's like like a, say a customer you know disabled a key, now they can't list any of their secrets, and you know or, or like sometimes we get a case where a customer disabled a key and then they tried to do a key rotation to like fix the API server problem, but it's sort of like you know, that, yeah, that's a high leverage thing you can do in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, and what? and then we need to figure out, or, you know, wh like which secrets do they need to delete to recover the cluster? So hopefully that logging helps. Um, yeah, it, it helps. It, like it, it, there's no good default options there. Like yeah. delete, automatically delete the data is bad. No, that's bad and it, like yeah. automatically like prevent access to the entire type is also bad. <laughs> Right. I, I, I don't know if there's any way we can make lists like somehow more lenient, <laughs> like, like, get, you know, give me the things that you could decrypt, but not the things that you couldn't. I don't like that. I'm sure that breaks. Yeah, so out. we used to do that and Mike fixed that. So it didn't do that anymore <laughs> because I, I, I think that's probably the worst of all options because having an inconsistent list that says it's consistent is like, I think just catastrophically bad from like just a consistency standpoint and now you have systems that will take that inconsistent list and act on it uh and you have no idea what's going to happen afterwards um yeah i so i i think we talked about this a lot on the initial kms uh v2 conversations and i think we basically said we just can't do anything here like 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 we, we can make the problem more obvious but we cannot give you an automatic solution you you, the operator, have to build your infrastructure to help your customers out of this hole, basically. Um, like probably on the AKS side, like, you know, at some point we'll hopefully have like a managed version of all of this that just doesn't give you the ability to screw up the keys and we'll just do all the yeah. rotation. Yeah, we, for you. yeah, I like it, my, I think my main sort of philosophical, like I understand the constraints, right? But like, I, in principle, if I break one secret in my cluster, then only things that depend on that one secret should break. Like, okay, the pod that mounts it breaks, you know, but I, I would like, you know, all the controllers that list secrets to be able to work around it and keep doing the things they need to do for all the secrets they can actually operate on. Um, and but, but we don't know the list, though, right? If the controller is doing a cluster-wide list of secrets, it's saying that it needs all secrets, and we can't give it a partial set. Yeah, but it's it's saying that because like it doesn't have any way to express anything else today, right? Like maybe maybe it's capable of being lenient. Like I don't know, maybe it all it does is annotate them with some random thing, and and you know if it can't annotate one, it's not that big a deal. I don't know. So, but I, it doesn't seem like we give give a lot of options today. I'm not convinced that if we did give an option now that like everybody would adopt it. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. I don't know if we, we ever get a guarantee at, the, at this point, but I, yeah, it is, it is, it is kind of a, we do see customers break clusters um, with, with, you know, doing a key operation and, and 
you know, where they, you know, they might prefer that some subset of, of the clusters still work. Would an endpoint that gave them visibility without seeing the logs or without parsing all the logs, gave them visibility into all the secrets that they had problems reading, and then they could look through it and pipe it to a cube control delete if they really wanted to. Yeah, something like that might not work. Or, but like, you have to have some sort of special delete. The secrets that are broken. Like it, like basically, if I had a list that returned, like, all you know, all the errors of things Cube API server couldn't read in the list, uh, that that might help. Cube control delete doesn't work. I, I realized that as I was saying it, uh, but so but an option that would say secrets? force delete, skip all finalizers, really, really delete this yeah, thing. Okay. Um, like, David, how many versions of delete can we possibly have? Like, I, you know, I only have like three options that mean now, you know, grace period zero for real force. Uh, clearly, we should have have uh, a really long <laughs> one for you should feel bad because you lost your encryption keys. But but like I can see this being a practical problem, right? Where we do this rotation, there's some stuff that's broken. The person who has it either doesn't want to grip through all the logs or can't. Uh, and then even once he has them, uh, he's unable to actually unwedge it without direct etcd access. And then providing a mechanism for him to say, no, really, just I screwed up, nuke these. Um, sounds like a practical solution that we may be able to give them as as part of this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, this is sort of off topic, but if we think about like someone who makes a list request and gets authorized to make the list request, like they have permission to view all the data that's going to come back in the list. If in the process of fulfilling that list request, we hit decode errors, um, like, surfacing that information in the error response isn't leaking any information to them that they didn't already have permission to see. Like, here's the names and namespaces of the things that we couldn't decode and maybe cap it at like the first, I don't know, 10, 100 something. Um, like, that gives them the information. And then on delete, like, if in the process of delete, we hit an encode error, like the person was authorized to delete, it's forked. Like maybe we allow that. I don't know. I, I could see something like that sort of using the API mechanisms we already have, the authorization mechanisms we already have to give them that information. Yeah. So I think something like that would help. Um, I'm also curious, like, is there anything we can do on, in updates? Uh, like if, if a secret's undecryptable, I assume I can't update it or apply over it, uh, even if there's a controller trying to apply something over it. Yeah. Uh, and and in that case, like there's already a part of the system that's trying to heal the system by just applying over it, but it's being blocked by updates. The, way harder, like delete, like go out and come in again, um, is a lot safer. Like we don't validate on delete, uh, we do validate on update, and update has like very particular rules about what can and cannot be changed. Um, so I think the escape hatch would probably be go out and come in again, like delete it and come in again. Yeah. Definitely. So we're veering a little bit. I'd like yeah. to really. Yeah, we are. In. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, I had a comment on the deck reuse. So if our objective is to um, increase the reuse of decks for ASGCM, can we switch from randomly generating the uh, IV to using a counter? Have you considered that, Mo? Um, what does it buy me exactly? Other than, I mean, if I in, was actually, let me think, sorry. It batches way more things under the same key. So that reads have fewer things to get keys for. What was that? Yeah, exactly. So it, that would. If, if our goal is to reduce the number of like active decks in use, mm -hmm. I could see an API server using uh, the same deck for, you know, the entire, probably the entire duration of its process. If we were using non-random IVs, we'd have no worry about this 200,000 birthday problem using that we have with random IVs, uh, which is that we will use an IV twice. If we are instead using like an atomic counter as the value for 
the IV. Um, yeah, I guess we could. Um, I, I, I guess in a sense, I would say that we can do that either way. Um, it's really more of just like, I, I think the core question here is not like how much we reuse the deck or exactly what process we use to make that safe. It's more about, can we just do it at all? Because I, I think once we get down to the contract of we're gonna we're willing to reuse the deck, if we want to improve on this further and use the counter-based approach with like, I guess, I don't know, like, a, are you thinking like a big int or are you thinking like just a UN64 that just increments up one? I think a UN64 would probably get us for most, uh, th through the lifetime of most Cube API server processes on a single key. Um, right. um, trying to think like what absurd write rate you would need to ever hit two to the 64 minus one. Uh, he, he death of the universe <laughs> most likely, but um, 200,000 a second for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. But um, I think what Jordan said is that it was never a goal to um, have a deck per object. So I think uh, regardless, if we all agree with Jordan in that, uh, then that answers your um, initial question, which is, is this okay? So yes. And I guess um, then if our goal is to um, reduce the number of active decks in the cluster, then there's probably better than uh, using uh, probably better methodology than using a random IV for uh, and a key for a minute, I would say. So are we OK with that like as the starting point? And then like I can keep iterating on it. And if we want to make it a key for like the life of the server, I think that would just be like I would have to re I would have to gut the GCM transformer and have it have a counter basically, but it's fine. Um, um, yeah, I think so. Like you already have a, you said that you would already have a counter for the limit to measure the number of writes, or is that, did I mishear you? you there, there, there's no, that said that there, there was a write. Yeah, there, there is just a pure, like, was I used at all? Um, I guess that wouldn't, uh, I mean, that's still, I think that concept sort of goes away if you're doing a counter though. So I would, I would remove, I think that mostly it would just be, has the key ID changed? Like we always have to rotate the key if the remote KMS is telling us that, Hey, it's, it's, it's root key is different now. So we're not going to keep reusing a deck then and that logic is already sort of there and correct. It's more of how long do you use this key for? I, um, I don't get why that goes away. Like if, if the concern is we're using the same deck more than a fixed number of times, like whether it's 200,000 or whatever the comment in the current code was, like why wouldn't we just- I, I think the comment in all the current code is based on the fact that we use random IVs. If you have a counter that is your IV, the birthday problem has simply disappeared. So the only time you need a new deck, there's only two cases. One is you have done two to the 64 minus one writes with it which we just said that probably will never ever happen. So we can maybe just ignore it. And then the other one is the remote KMS plugin has changed this key ID. Right, because there is there cannot be an IV collision now because it's a counter and it only goes up. I mean, if, if we have the ability to trigger a new deck for key ID, we can also trigger a new deck if we hit to the 64 minus one. Oh, you're right, right, right. I, yeah, we, we can, I, I just, do we care to? Should I write that code? Does it, does you it matter? Panic. Yeah, I mean, so so at 200,000 rice per second, that's 300,000 years. So I don't think it is plaus plausible that we will ever hit that. Um, and, and the counter resets when you restart the API server because it just goes and asks for a new one. Right, so if we generate the key locally and we have a counter for the IV, then we basically can use a deck without fear of IV reuse. Um, and we can have a sanity check if it goes to zero. Panic. <laughs> Crash the server internally. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get a new deck when it starts up again. Right. 
that, that is one way to do that. <laughs> Maybe not what a customer wants us to do, but you know, we're here. Um, okay, uh, I think we still got another item on the agenda. Uh, well, so one quick, I, I know I have two things. One, so it, am I hearing a strong desire for the counter-based approach like in this release? Well, if our goal is to uh, reduce the number of decks we have, I would say that is a better approach. Um, I don't have too much of a preference. I guess I can review the PR. Um, I guess take a look at it and see if it's going to be significantly more than we can land in the next before the 15th. Sorry, I like blanked out for a second. What was the last part you just said, Mike? Um, so I, I take a look at what it would take to do the counter. And if it's more than you think we can land in the 15th, then I'm fine with foregoing it for now. Um, okay. Uh, and the other thing was, uh, like, let's see, Stonda, Michael, is anybody interested in writing a cap for status tells me, like the, the return status on a failure tells me what stuff was not decryptable and a super magic delete nuke button to help me find, delete those. Yes. I don't want that to be part of KMS, but I do want it as a general thing. Anybody want to do that? Anybody interested? Nobody here is interested. I'll ask her. Sanda, how interesting. Uh, I mean, sure. Uh, I'm just trying to understand how we would situate such a cap. Like you, you, you're saying that we would have a status on the resource that we are failing to decrypt. No, no, no. When when you do a, a API call that fails, the return is a status object. Oh. In that, you could somehow include this information in some nice structured way that is parsable with some probably some limit of how much data is sent back. And then you would need, uh, after the, the user has this, you would need super fancy delete number four that <laughs> that means like, I really don't care how you, how right yeah yeah oh I I, I see I understand so so basically you 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 would first tell them well I, I tried my best but, but I really really couldn't uh, couldn't get this for you because it's very likely broken and then you would you would have a fancy fancy way to, to say well I, I really really want to remove this because it's messing up with, with the rest of my resources of the time. Yeah, so the part that I think we'd never get past is doing something automatically for people because if they just, you know, soft deleted a key in their HSM, they can just undelete it and the the cluster will be back. So that that's like step 0, like do try to do that, but yep. right now in like AKS and GKE, if you have actually lost the key, it's make a ticket to support and they go and fix that CD for you, right? Right, yeah, yeah. I I think I have seen that happen at least once. And I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I can, I can try to put something together. Okay. All right. So awesome. let's uh, get to these last two. Um, the next one is SE denied deprecation uh, warning. There is, it looks like there is a PR open. Yep. And I mean, I'm here actually. Uh, I just had a question for you. It's 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 really down to the earth, but it's, it's really like uh, how can I basically add warnings uh, on the creation of pods in cluster that uses uh, that use this uh, um, security context plugin? It was basically that because I I just missed that for the one twenty seven uh, step. So I don't know if it's clear what I ask for, but. Uh, if you can provide me some help on how to do that, it would be amazing. Jordan? I was about to say, uh, we have the guy who implemented the feature, so I'm sure he can. <laughs> what? I mean, I, I, I'm sure we could all figure it out. I just did I implement that feature? Oh, oh you're talking about the one. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you did. The yeah. API warnings are a weird place to, uh, like the, the audience for this deprecation is the person running the server, not the people making API calls. So I think emitting a warning from the server log when the server starts, like that looks right to me. Does anybody okay. look at those, Jordan? Does anybody what? 
does anybody actually look at this? Is this act like how, how, I don't know if this is sufficient to say the thing is going away. I mean, the the right audience is not the people making the API calls. No, I, I I don't disagree with you there. I was more like, should it show up in the Kubernetes audit log, like as an audit annotation saying, "Hey, I processed this pod for you with this broken plugin, so you like you should care." Like, yeah. I, like does like, anybody I'm, like randomly read the audit logs? I don't. I didn't. I, yeah, at least it's more persistent, right? Like, it might actually get stored somewhere. No one's going to notice, no matter what we do, no one's going to notice when we get rid of this thing until the release that it's gone. Um, and like the nicest thing to do for them probably is to have a feature gate for it that says this thing no longer exists when the feature gate's on. Put that thing all the way to, and now it's gone. And then give them one release where they can do an, oh my gosh, set it back. Uh, and in the next release, the feature gate's gone. Yeah, I think we've done that in the past, right, David, for some uh, I have done it at least once. I don't remember what for. And nobody there's complains a, uh, until... a feature they... gate state called deprecated um, that you can set a feature gate to. Yeah. yeah. So it says that this is alpha in 1.0. So I, I suppose that we didn't probably didn't have feature gates then, and this is not guarded. So yep. popping it behind an alpha feature gate seems reasonable. Um, and then that gives us the one release to revert and then proceed from there. But as far as like letting people know, is logs probably fine for the deprecation warning then, especially if we break people on upgrade um, unless they enable the alpha feature. Yeah. Uh, requiring them to opt into a gate to use it and logging and giving them a release is seems fine. Like anyone who's relying on this to keep them secure is going to be disappointed. <laughs> so it's actually uh, unhelpful to like continue letting them release after release guard things yeah. like this. So. Sounds good. Uh, did you get all that? We can, I can comment on the uh, PR as well with that recommendation. Yeah, yeah. No, I think if it's enough, uh, it's okay. It's okay. All right, cool. Um, I'll summarize that on the PR. Next item uh, to hear uh, support for matching combination of sign name and label selector to assemble support for matching a single cluster trust bundle by name. Yeah, so this was something that we went over and over and over on in um, the first API review on the Cube API server piece, which was like, how do we, so Kubelets mount these cluster trust bundles by name, how do we restrict the name so that signers aren't like spoofing each other's names? Um, one of the ideas that was floated was, well, let's just have Kubelet mount these things by uh, signer name and label selector. And so now it can do that. Do we actually need the ability to mount the, a specific one by name or is it an acceptable experience to say like, you've always got to set a signer name, even if it's a dummy signer name that you just made up and you've always got to put a label on it. How do we expect consumers to know the labels? The labels would be, I guess, something that you have to read the documentation for your signer for. I was thinking like maybe for the entry signers, we would say have a label called live um, or something like that. That is like, I don't really care. And then we would label them with a counter or something as we do rotations. If you do care specifically about seeing rotations. I expect maybe most third-party implementations would copy whatever we did with the entry one. The only yeah. exception would be if you have some sort of MTLS setup where you're federating two different trust domains, you might use labels to distinguish between them. The trust so label selector required? If you don't get the selector, do you just get all the bundles for that signer? I have no idea. I didn't try it. <laughs> 
Um, What's that? That is a thing we should know the answer to. Um, <laughs> trying to know which label selector you need is. Um, seem, I'll think about that. That seems like a, a challenge because unless there's some standard set. Yeah, it might it might help to like have the use cases that we're envisioning. So like rotation is a good use case. Um, targeting a specific, uh, like for MTLS, targeting a specific uh, destination. Um, like label selectors are super flexible, so I'm pretty confident that they could enable almost any use case we could dream up. Um, going the next step and saying like, for these use cases, how would they know the selector to specify? Would it be a convention? Would it be a default? Would it be like? Sure, yeah. that's something we should answer. I guess what the question I'm asking is a little more focused, which is like, we've replaced the question of use magic to determine which name your signer was using to use magic to determine which label selector your signer wants you to use. Um, so that, like, do we need to still need to have the other option? Um, at least for the ones that I'm envisioning, like the entry signers, like I, I would not expect people to need to use selectors for those. Like if I, um, if I want the trust bundles for the API server, um, like I kind of want all of them. And if a new one comes in, then I want it. And sure. You know, and so for the entry ones, you know, before we would have been putting them in Kata's IO dash blah, 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 long name that you know from reading the documentation. Uh, now we could say, hey, it'll be, you, you set the signer name to be kates.io slash API server. And maybe we say, don't put a label selector or we say put label selector equals live. Yeah, so if we if we start with the use cases and then figure out which of those use cases would actually require the consumer to know the label selector, and if a lot of them don't even require them to know the label selector, that seems positive. And if there are use cases that you know, require you know, specific selection, like I want blue green or you know this particular target, like you have ways to do that. But presumably, people with such specific use cases would already need to be like following documentation about how to accomplish that use case. It, it would be nice if the ones that we're, we're gonna use for entry, if they don't require magic knowledge or like more detailed knowledge than just, I want the bundle for this signer. Okay. Cool. Um, where, where do you want to sort that out to you? The PR, um, I, guess. I guess. So the problem is it's split over two PRs, right? Mm -hmm. um, the relevant, whether or not we keep the name restrictions. Currently, I think the PR, the first PR in the stack is updated to not keep the name restrictions anymore. Um, um, because you can now, because it's a moot point because you don't need to read the documentation to know how, like to know, you can just, you just need to know your signer name, which you needed to know anyways. Um, it's, it's not completely moot, right? Like otherwise everybody who's writing trust bundles has to deal with like, maybe my name is already taken by another signer. I mean, that's like, Everybody's got that problem, no matter what software component you're writing. Just slap your name in there. Um, yeah, I. so a lot of the things that will either generate names, so we'll, we'll generate pod names or generate CSR names or things like that. Um, and we have things that do cleanup on those. So you sort of fire and forget, and then you don't have to worry about managing it. 
Um, here, like presumably, whatever name you create, like you have to manage that and either update it or like delete it later as part of a rotation. So you actually have to keep track of all of your managed objects. Um, sure, and you do that by selecting via signer name, which is a selectable field. If you wanna know all the ones that are related to your signer, or you remember that you put my fancy signer as the start of them. You won't be able to delete someone else's trust bundle because of admission checks. You won't be able to mess with it. All the admission checks are based on the signer name field. Hmm. Good question. Let me just do on that a little bit. Okay. I guess we can do the discussion on the first PR because the name restrictions are. Yeah. Okay. Time check. Thanks, everyone. I let's talk in a, two weeks. Uh, the code freezes on March fifteenth. All right. Bye, everyone.